Hello, this is Jason. Back with another walk and talk. And I won't even say walk and talk to Jason because I assume that's implied. Since my name is Jason and I am walking and talking. So this is obviously a walk and talk with Jason. <laughs> uh, so today is the day after election day and Donald Trump is elected yet again I am I am I am no fan of Donald Trump I, I'm pretty sure most people know that <laughs> but Donald Trump was definitely the best candidate for Bitcoin so in my Bitcoin interest Donald Trump was the best candidate to win even though I despise him as a human being <laughs> and Bitcoin um, rallied it's got up to over $76,000 today and I made enough money in a day to fund living in Thailand for a year or more so we're off to the races so my plan has always been to go to Thailand I want to retire early in Thailand and the timeline was by the time I'm 50 because you do have to be 50 to get a retirement visa in Thailand but now they have this new destination Thailand visa and that's good for like 360 days a year in Thailand which is enough, you know, because <laughs> I, I don't plan on staying in Thailand all year anyway. I want to travel around and go to Vietnam and Malaysia and Philippines. So get, getting over there before I'm 50 is definitely an option. And with Donald Trump pumping Bitcoin it's just it just might uh, get me to Thailand sooner and I've seen some uh, there's a plan B guy he does this like stock to flow models of Bitcoin which has been relatively accurate through past cycles the last cycle what kind of the last cycle broke all the models and predictions just because FTX happened which was the Sam Bankman Freed guy he, he kind of was you know he was a big scammer and he kind of messed up Bitcoin from his FTX exchange because they were like buying Bitcoin they, they just had paper Bitcoin and they're using Bitcoin and selling it and buying shit coins and <laughs> they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff stuff that he didn't even know about and I don't know how complicit he actually was in on it I mean he's going to prison forever because tons of people lost money tons of rich and powerful people lost money so whenever that happens you're you're gonna pay <clears throat> but I don't know whether he was complicit or just incompetent I'm kind of thinking he was more incompetent based on what I've heard. But regardless, he messed up the whole third Bitcoin cycle. So the last cycle was supposed to get to like 100,000 and it only got to like 60, what was it, 68,000, something like that. So 
and then the cycle before that got to 10,000, and the cycle before that got to 1,000. So every cycle, it's like 10 X's. So you can just add a zero to the end, and that's where it's, it should hit. So 1,000 first cycle, 10,000 second cycle, 100,000 third cycle, it was supposed to, but got cut short. So this cycle, the plan B guy with the stock to flow model says it should hit 1 million. $1 million a Bitcoin. And that just seems totally crazy to me. But every previous cycle has been crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, it's been crazy three times before in the three previous cycles. So why would the fourth cycle not be crazy? It'd be crazy for the fourth cycle to be not crazy. <laughs> Because it's, you know, one time is like, wow. Second time is, oh, that's a coincidence. Third time, okay, we got a pattern. And, and that's kind of what gave me the confidence to go so deep into Bitcoin this time. Is just the pattern. It's not just a coincidence. It's not a fluke. It's a a repeating pattern that keeps happening and I'm confident enough that it'll happen again that I was willing to to go big on it where I've I bought in before like I bought in before the first having back in 2011 or something But it was always small. And each time that I'd buy in, it was just, you know, I was just playing around. Oh, this is a cool little project that these people made. I'll buy, you know, $100 worth, $1,000 worth. And then it went like forexed and like, man, I made $3,000. That was easy. But it, it just so volatile. And, you know, I would just think that it's going to zero. It's how I thought back then. Even when it went to like 20,000 in the second cycle, I think I had bought in around like 8,000 and sold at like 16,000, like doubled my money. And I had only bought in like maybe one Bitcoin. So, you know, I made 8,000 bucks. So I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. 8,000 bucks. <laughs> but it, it does crash afterwards. So, and, and not crash to, it never goes as low as what it was before in the previous cycle. It sets a new floor each time. So, uh, and I forget what it was, but, but there's, there's definitely a pattern to it. And that's what I'm, I'm riding. And I talked about not just being into Bitcoin, but following Michael Saylor and his company, MicroStrategies. And in my last video, I talked about selling my Bitcoin ETFs and going into the putting MicroStrategy in my IRAs. <clears throat> and I did do that. So I bought in the MicroStrategy around $222 a share. <sighs> and, I, and that's another one. I had, you know, bought MicroStrategy back in, in the beginning of the year. Like, I forget, maybe March, April time frame. And that was before the split. And I, I might have bought in like around 1300 a share and sold it at like 2000 a share. I made some quick money. 
but post split that was a 10 to 1 split so that was like 113 a share and sold at 200 a share and now I'm buying back in at 222 a share so and it's gone up and down pretty crazy like the volatility of MicroStrategy is even higher than Bitcoin so it, if you don't have faith in the uh, in Bitcoin it's not something that you should really buy into because it's going to go up and down it's crazy fluctuations hello and here I'm going to spin you guys around so you don't have to look at my stupid face <laughs> uh, I don't have my other camera because I'm not wearing anything where I could really mount this pocket three at the moment and I didn't feel like fiddling around with it so I just grabbed my pocket three and I hit the road and I have to walk much earlier too it's four I left at like 4 30 because of the stupid daylight wasting time that we're on now we're no longer in daylight savings time we're on daylight wasting time so like i don't really get off work until five o'clock and if i left at five o'clock the sun would be completely down before i even got up here to the brushy creek path so i just i just work for eight hours straight and then i take my lunch at four o'clock and now i can take my walk and still have a little bit of sunlight So yeah, back to MicroStrategy. I went all in with my IRA, my Roth IRA and my traditional IRA. And $222 a share. And I did say that I was just gonna hold Bitcoin only in my individual brokerage account, but I lied. I sold half of my Bitcoin and used that to buy MicroStrategy stock in my individual account. So it, it's very similar to holding Bitcoin, but it's a leveraged play on Bitcoin because of all the things that I talked about that MicroStrategy can do with capital markets, selling bonds and buying Bitcoin issuing new shares of the company buying bitcoin and uh what's the other thing that they do there's three big ones selling bonds issuing shares oh and just taking loans very low uh interest rate loans so they have a bitcoin yield on their stock which was like 15% so you're getting like 15% more Bitcoin per share every year just holding their stock but there is a premium on on the shares but it just it, it appreciates at such a faster rate than Bitcoin does that to me it's worth it it's worth paying that premium because you're paying for MicroStrategy to do all these tricks that you can't do. I can't go out and get a loan for 0.625% and buy Bitcoin with it. If I could, I would, but they could do it. I can't issue shares of a stock that's $260 a share and use all that money to buy more Bitcoin but they can and I can't issue convertible debt bonds to you know large institutions and use that money to buy Bitcoin they can so to have access to those capital market products 
that I don't have access to, it's worth paying a premium. And right now that premium is around 3X. So for $220 a share, you're only getting about one third of that price in Bitcoin. But as they do all those tricks and buy, each time they're buying more Bitcoin, you're getting more and more, so. But is it really about the, how much Bitcoin you have? Or is it about the increase in the money that you have invested? And to me, it's, you know, I like to have Bitcoin for the future because there, there is a certain amount of risk of buying a security, a stock, like MicroStrategy, you know, something could come out about Michael Saylor, the chairman that, you know, he did something, who knows what, you know, that he's under investigation and, and the, the shares of MicroStrategy would, would plummet. So there's, you know, that kind of risk comes with owning stock in a company. Whereas Bitcoin, when you own Bitcoin, there's no, there's no CEO. There's no, like it's the most secure network that has ever existed and probably will ever exist in the history of humanity. It can't be hacked, it can't be cracked. <clears throat> I was just looking today and like, I asked the uh, chat GPT, like how long would it take to crack Shaf 256 encryption with all the computing power in the world. And it said it would take billions of years, billions and billions of years, perhaps longer than the uh, age of the universe with all the computing power that we have in the world. So I'd say it's pretty secure. <laughs> uh, but like there is a risk in the future of quantum computers because that's with just regular you know microprocessors how long it take but quantum computing maybe at some point in the future quantum computer would be able to crack SHA-256 but if that's ever even on the horizon of possibilities I think they already have like encryption algorithms that can run on quantum computers and you know you could up, update the whole Bitcoin network with quantum computer proof encryption algorithms that would protect it from quantum hacks. <coughs> but that's so far in the future, that's not gonna happen. So the risks of, there, there's really no counterparty risks with Bitcoin. Well, if, if you're, and that's if you're storing it like in cold storage, the risks that do come with it, the network itself is secure, but the risks that come along with it is your own personal incompetence, like sending Bitcoin to the wrong Bitcoin address and it just going into a black hole forever, or like having a hardware wallet that fails and you don't have a backup of your keys your Bitcoin's gone forever. Uh, <clears throat> being uh, social engineered by like scammers, social engineer hackers that call and say, you know, I'm, I actually got a call today that said they're from Coinbase. I saw it, like it shows a preview on uh, my phone, on my Pixel. Like you can screen calls. And it said, like, this is whatever from Coinbase. We got a request for a password change and are going to approve it. But we just wanted to make sure that it was you that was requesting this password change. And no one's going to call you from Coinbase saying someone's changing your password and they're going to approve it. Like, that's scammer, social engineering crap. 
So people that like answer the phone, they're like, oh, no, I'm, I didn't say that I was changing my password. Oh, well, let's, let's secure your Coinbase account now, sir. Um, what's your current password? Oh, it's 5427Q exclamation point. Okay, let's, uh, and what would you like your new password to be? Oh, 257Q a pound. Okay, we'll get that taken care of for you. You have a nice day, sir. And then they log into your Coinbase account and clear out all your Bitcoin. <laughs> That's what that is all about and billions of dollars people there's like billions of dollars of and that's considered a hack a social engineering hack which is basically people fooling you into thinking there's someone else <laughs> for you to give them access to your accounts <clears throat> and it happens all the time like you know you hear it all the time about people like them preying on old people or they you know, say, the big one is, they'll, they'll send like an email and say, thank you for your purchase of Amazon for $1,500 for this iPhone 16 Pro. And they're like, oh my goodness, someone bought $1,600 iPhone on, for Amazon on my account. And there's a phone number there at the bottom. If you did not make this purchase, call 1-800-I'm-a-scammer. And they call and they're like, Oh, I just got this email that said someone bought a $1,600 iPhone on Amazon on my account. I didn't do that. Oh, okay, sir. Let's get you a refund for that right away. Um, I'm going to send you a link here if you can click on that and bring it up. And they, they remote desktop into the computer. They say, okay, can you log into your bank account for me here? Okay, and they log in to their bank account and then the screen goes black. Oh, well, I just lost the screen. Oh, no, no problem, sir. We'll, we'll get that cleared up in a second. They just, you know, black, blank out the screen. And on the other end, they're transferring all their money to their account because they just logged into their bank account website. And then like 30 seconds, a minute later, however long it takes, not long. <laughs> they log back in and they can you know do uh inspect elements and change the website to make it look like you know they gave you sixteen hundred dollars back on your account or whatever but as soon as you refresh the web page that, that goes away oh. so there's all kinds of scams that's what i'm saying you have to just be vigilant and but hardly ever will anyone call you asking you for access to your accounts. Like Amazon's never going to call you and say, oh, can you log into your Amazon account for me? Like they can, Amazon has access to your Amazon account. If they want to see something on your account, they can see it. They don't, they're not going to call you and ask you for your password. Never give your password to anyone ever. <laughs> I can't believe that I'm having to say this in 2024, but there's still billions of dollars a year being taken from people that do that kind of thing. So apparently I do have to tell people. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, back to MicroStrategy. I sold half my Bitcoin. I bought MicroStrategy, same price, $222. And right as, you know, it was, the night was going on, it was, it was getting more and more evident that Donald Trump was gonna win. Bitcoin price is going up. And MicroStrategy, being a leveraged play on Bitcoin, is going up at exponentials more. So Bitcoin will go up, you know, 6%, and MicroStrategy will go up like 18%. So I got way more gains last night because I, I just went and bought all into this on Monday. 
I switched out from being in a Bitcoin ETF and holding all Bitcoin to just now. I reduced my Bitcoin position by a lot. <laughs> a lot. Where uh, I'm probably like, it's more than half into MicroStrategy. It's probably like a third Bitcoin, two thirds MicroStrategy right now through across all my accounts. And my personal accounts, it's like half and half. But, you know, my IRAs, they got switched over too. So, yeah. It's probably more like a quarter. Three fourths, three fourths micro strategy, one quarter Bitcoin. So, needless to say, it worked out. And went up enough. I think MicroStrategy went up to 260. And I bought it in at 222. And you know, my Bitcoin, I bought in earlier this year at like 40 something in January. That's the first that I bought in this cycle. And it went up to 76,000. So it's almost at double where I bought in at the beginning of the year. So it's doing well. And I told my friends I wasn't going to talk about Bitcoin with them anymore until it hits 300,000, which is what I said it would hit by the uh, November 2025. That was my personal prediction. But uh, like plan B stock to flow model prediction is 1 million. He's, I think he said it'd be 300,000 like by the spring. I'll put it on the screen what his prediction is. But that's just wild to me. You know, over three times, but I think it'll be but I'd be happy with that. I'd be very happy with that. So, I've said that if it hits 300,000, I'd quit, quit my job. Ooh. But if it's like, if it hits 1 million, I mean, I'll quit. I'll quit everything. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do. Like, that would be... great. Just be set. It's like, if it gets to 300, that just... that's enough to be comfortable just a like normal Southeast Asia expense living like $3,000 a month for the rest of my life $36,000 a year like that's not you know crazy cra crazy money but a million dollars that would get me to, uh, uh, what would that even be? That would be over, over $100,000 a year until I die. And spending over $100,000 a year until I die in Southeast Asia, you know, that's royalty level. <laughs> that's not like one bedroom condo but has nice amenities. That's like three bedroom, 2,000 square foot condo. And one of the nicest condos there is. Flying first class in between countries. That sounds nice. I'm not holding my breath. Oh, it's five o'clock. 
I'm officially off work. Oh, I need a drink. A second. Oh. Got a little uh, Gatorade Zero I mixed up. So yeah, Donald Trump is uh, very good for my retirement prospects. And I knew that ahead of time. I knew he would be better for Bitcoin. He would actually uh, be best for my own self-interests. He will make people that have a lot of assets, whether that's Bitcoin or houses or businesses, stocks, all those people are going to do very well. And his, his idea of helping working class people is giving people that have assets and business owners more breaks, cutting taxes, boosting their assets. It's trickle down economics. It's Reaganomics, which and it didn't work. Reaganomics don't work. <laughs> the like he might make a that, like what my mom wants as long as the gasoline goes down to like I don't know two dollars a gallon. That's her measure of of success. <laughs> if Trump can make gas go down to two dollars a gallon, then he's the best president ever. And, and it doesn't matter if he has to give uh, the gas companies unfettered access to all the national parks and cut their, make them not have to pay any taxes, let them exploit everything, <laughs> and break in three times the profits. But if you get gas down to $2 a gallon, that's all fine. And that's how a lot of people think. And, and I'm not a woman, so the abortion stuff, that doesn't matter to me. I will never bleed out in an emergency room parking lot because the hospital staff are too afraid to help you because they could be prosecuted by the state if, if, if what they do causes you to lose the baby. There was like an 18 year old girl that died because the hospital wouldn't help her because she was pregnant. And she, did, she, she didn't want an abortion. She was hurting, she was in pain and they wouldn't help her. And she had some kind of infection think like a, a staph infection and ended up dying because they wouldn't treat her because she was pregnant. I was in Texas. But there's hundreds of those stories. Just Google. Google it. A pregnant woman dying because the hospital wouldn't treat her due to abortion laws. <clears throat> but I'm not a woman. That won't affect me. And I'm also a white man. So I will not be affected by all of the uh, mass deportation stuff that's going to occur and rounding up people, rounding up a bunch of brown people and putting them in detention camps. That's the only way that there's going to be able to be deported. They have to be processed. They have to... It's, it's going to be messy. You're not going to deport, like, millions of people without there being a, a big mess. But I don't have to worry about that. It won't affect me. But I'm sympathetic to, to you know, those people. Sympathetic to the, the women who are dying. 
and I voted against Donald Trump, even though he will benefit me way more than Kamala would have. So I'm going to be just fine. But, and I don't have a daughter. I don't have a wife. I mean, it was really, and my mom can't get pregnant anymore, or my grandma. <laughs> so really no, no women, even in my life, will be affected. I know that the people that are like, anti-abortion they just think it's about you know they don't want women going in and using abortion as like birth control and I'd say well, no one wants that that's not cool <laughs> but the anti-abortion laws are more than about like using abortion as birth control it's pregnant women not being able to get access to health care because the laws are so draconian that if they do anything that causes the woman to lose the baby, they could be held liable, <laughs> like for murder. <laughs> so who would want to take that risk to help someone? They, they end up, you know, sending them to another hospital. Go over there. Go over to that hospital. See if they'll help you. Oh, no, you go over there. Oh, you can go home. And they go home and they die. <clears throat> you know, if they're having a miscarriage, they're bleeding. They're like, oh, no, we can't. We can't intervene. We can't help you. It's messed up. But I guess the good thing is there are a lot of states that are signing, like, abortion rights into the Constitution of their state. But, you know, there's still going to be states where this kind of thing happens. I'm pretty sure Texas is one of them. So, it's kind of sad. <clears throat> so, that's my thoughts on that. And I'm concerned about uh, the... The, uh, how can I word it? The cozying up to the world's dictators like Putin and Kim Jong il and those people. And he said he was going to end the uh, war in Ukraine on day one, Let's see if that happens. I'm pretty sure his way of ending the war is just cutting all funding, not sending any weapons to Ukraine anymore and just letting them get overrun by Russia, which a lot of people are just fine with that, but I don't think that Russia is going to stop at Ukraine. This was kind of a, a chance to be able to hold Putin back and drain his resources without actually having to send U.S. soldiers in to intervene. And I mean, we could, we print money. <laughs> Us sending money to Ukraine is not coming out of your paycheck. The U.S. government literally prints it. Like that's, that's why I'm in Bitcoin. Because the U.S., the money supply is inflated at 8 to 10% a year, which devalues your money 8 to 10% a year. <clears throat> like, it's not coming from taxes. Taxes are just a way to help counter the inflation rate of money. Like, because they're printing trillions, trillions of dollars a year. So they're trying to take money back out of circulation to try to limit how much 
it's devaluing the currency. But it's not like if they don't take your tax money, then they can't send the money to Ukraine. Like, they can just print it. They create it out of nothing. Punch some numbers in the computer. It's Like, it's not even really printing anymore. It's just uh, hit a few numbers. Hello. Hit a few uh, numbers on a keyboard. Press enter. Now we've just created a trillion dollars. There you go. Have a nice day. <laughs> Where I, I hear like, you know, balancing the budget and they act like the US government is like a household budget where they have to tighten, tighten their belt and crack down on spending or else we're not gonna be able to pay our bills tomorrow. Where that's not how, how it works at the uh, federal government level. We'll never not be able to spend, like, pay our bills. There's no amount of money that can't be created to service debts. We'll never default on debts. We'll never go bankrupt as a federal government. Because you could always just create more money, and that's what they do. And it slowly devalues the currency over time and it's not because of you know one certain president like Trump created 8 trillion dollars in debt or whatever but his way was not so much increasing spending hello it was from cutting off the, uh, the taxes that were coming in to counter it so that caused the debt to go up just as much as, you know, Democrats that increase spending without increasing taxes, you know, cutting taxes without decreasing spending has the exact same effect <clears throat> as far as the, the raising of the debt. And that's always going to happen. No one's ever going <laughs> to cut spending. Like they, they, they might like you hear uh, them saying like they want to cut social programs, crack down on food stamps, cut social security, raise the retirement age of social security. So you have to, you know, you won't be able to draw social security until you're 70, and then 75, you know, like and it's, that's your money you're paying into Social Security. So I'm not a fan on watering down social programs as a way to uh, <clears throat> balance the budget, so to speak. That's, that's bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Feed hungry people. Give the... Uh, Retiring people access to their money that they paid in all their lives. I'm all for that. I think there should be more social services. Universal health care is one. <clears throat> and I'm not a Democrat. I don't like Trump. I wasn't a fan of Kamala. It's just that I would, I voted for Kamala because I was more in favor of her policies than Trump's. Not that I, I liked her <laughs> as a candidate. And they messed up by, uh, by just kind of, you know, giving her the nomination without it being voted on. I'd say it really falls on Biden as a fault because he said he was only going to be a one-term president in 2020 and everyone voted for him. For, with that in mind, I'm just going to be here one term and I'll be gone. And then as this election came up, he was like, yeah, change my mind. I'm sticking around. <laughs> 
and then he has mush for brains. I think Kamala only had a few months to try to pull a campaign together. When if Joe would have bowed out after one term, like he said he was going to, there could have been a primary and they could have picked people that they wanted. I would have loved to see Bernie in there again, even though Bernie's getting pretty old now, but I mean, if he's running against Trump, he's about the same age as Trump, so if people are electing Trump, they should be able to elect Bernie. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of a democratic socialist. So, made it to my picnic table, and it took me 47 minutes. Whew. Ah. And the sun is already behind the trees. So I didn't loot, even uh, leave soon enough. 4.30 to make it here to really see the sunset. <sighs> I'm gonna have to leave it like right at four o'clock soon after. <clears throat> <sighs> well, that's pretty much all I got. Thanks for hanging out with me. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, Bitcoin's really going to be taken off from here. I'll probably stop talking about it so much because, like, this is really when it takes off and then it, it becomes, like, bragging <laughs> where all my talk of it this year leading up to now was kind of to raise awareness, maybe get people to look into it themselves to be able to you know, make a decision on if they wanted to buy it or not. But it's going to be going parabolic soon, so just know where I'm at on it. <laughs> and I, I'll try not to talk about it so much anymore, even though it's one of my only interests. I don't know what else I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Maybe I will talk about it. I mean, I told my friends I wasn't going to talk about it in like our group chat anymore. So I know the people that you know just don't want to hear about it. It can kind of be like Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door every day, asking you if I'm trying to save your soul. Be like, oh, my soul's fine, thanks. <laughs> Ugh. So, I don't want to be too annoying. So, if you're interested in Bitcoin, go watch my previous videos. And that's really all I got for now. I'm just going to chill out here for a little bit. Oh, man. I forgot to bring my headlamp. So, I'm going to have to get going or else I'll be walking in the dark through the woods and that's really scary <laughs> alright guys thanks for hanging out and I'll talk to you later take it easy <laughs>